Good morning. I am Pastor Dave Carl, and I oversee the Children's and Family Ministries, and I'm glad to welcome you, you here today. Um, they don't often let the children's pastor up here. There's, there's rumors that I might not be mature enough to handle all of this, but I'm going to hit every, every point and uh, not miss a thing. So, <laughs> I almost stabbed myself sitting down with this, so I'm just glad to be here. Um, today, Pastor Chuck is um, on his summer break with Cynthia. They're resting and enjoying themselves, so um, welcome anyway. We have a great service for you. Um, we have with us in his place um, Jonathan Murphy, who has been with us for the last two weeks. And um, the first week he was here, I read his, his bio, which is very interesting. He's a professor at DTS and really, really smart guy and um, preaches at uh, Fort Worth Church when he's not here with us. But everyone likes him. He's a great preacher, and he's a very snappy dresser. So we're, we're thrilled to have him with us today. Aside from this service, we have four services, inc including this one. We have four services on a Sunday morning. We have this service at 9 o'clock and at 1045. In our multi-purpose room, we have 9 o'clock, the contemporary service. And at 1045, right now, in the multi-purpose room, we have our Spanish service, Stonebriar and Espanol. So we have four morning services here on Sunday morning, and if you just come in and come to this service, you might not know that we have all of that to choose from. Um, I would encourage you to check your phones and make sure that they are on silence so that uh, they don't trigger somewhere during the, the message. Um, as the children's pastor, I feel the impulse to let you know that as school is starting, has started for many summers starting this next week, we are starting back up again as well. So we are beginning our programming. You may or may not know that since the whole COVID thing, we've not had an elementary programming first hour at 9 o'clock. We're wanting to do that. We want to begin that on September 12th. But right now, we don't have enough adult volunteers in order to pull this off. So we are looking for volunteers to work 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings with elementary. And for that matter, Wednesday night, we have, we have needs everywhere. And this is the church body coming together, in this case, to help um, raise our children and point them toward Jesus, which is what we are here for. So aside from serving, we have a number of opportunities for you to connect. And I will leave you with the lovely Sarah McFarland on our Stonebriar Minute. I have a question for you. Who is your community? Who are the people in your life who truly know you, who pray for you and encourage you, and you do the same for them? Whether you already have community and want more of it, or don't have it but wish you did, you're invited to come and experience authentic connection with God and others this fall. And here's how. Our ministry programs are about to kick off for the fall, so now is a great time to find your place to connect. We have an amazing lineup of adult Bible studies starting up on campus and online, plus small groups and Sunday fellowships for every stage of life. We also have specialized programs like Marriage Corps for couples and our Six Essentials class for senior adults. And if you're going through a difficult season, you can find hope through our care and support groups. All of these opportunities are designed to strengthen your relationship with God and build the kind of community He desires for His church the kind that's full of love, truth, and joy. To find your place to connect, visit stonebriar.org fall, or come and talk with our staff in the atrium after worship today. We're here to help you take your next step toward deeper connection with God and his people. In our first hymn this morning, we will sing these words, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. There's a story that that hymn is based on. Let me tell it to you quickly. The story was told by Jesus. It's recorded in Matthew 7. The Lord says this, There were two men. They each built a house. One man built his house on solid rock. The other man built his house on sand. 
I think they were in the same neighborhood or probably the same town because Jesus says the same two houses experienced the same severe storm. Rains fell, the streams swelled, terrific wind blew. And the house that was built on the rock stood and the other one collapsed. I first learned that story when I was a child. There's a, a nice, clever little song that goes along with it. You probably remember that. But uh, I misunderstood the, the whole message throughout most of my adult life. And because Jesus, when he's explaining the story, he says this. This is the difference between uh, the two men. It, it's not that, that one was a believer in Christ and one was not. He says this. The man who built his, built his house on the rock is like one who hears my word and practices it, obeys them. The other one hears my word as well, but does not practice what I say. That's the difference. Elsewhere, Paul would say, do not be hearers of the word only, but be doers of the word. Isn't that a great story? So as we sing this morning, this song will affirm our faith that Christ is the solid rock, and uh, perhaps will encourage us, encourage us once again to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Would you stand and sing vigorously, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand?
Uh, thank you for singing so well. Thank you. Be seated. Well, on Friday of this week, uh, we got a phone call that those who were prepared to sing this morning, a special, uh, became ill. So we started thinking about uh, what to do about that. We called Laura Kuzman and said, Laura, I know this is only two days notice, but would you please sing on Sunday? And she said yes. Well, this morning when we were rehearsing, uh, Laura's uh, from Romania. Her native language is Romanian. So at the last minute, I said, Laura, the song you're singing, I'd rather have Jesus. Would you sing one verse in Romanian? And she said, sure, I'll do that. So, Laura, you're a rock star this morning. Yeah. <laughs> Stepping in at the last minute, singing. Thank you.
you would turn with me into your Bibles to Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 44. And as is our tradition, if you would stand with me in honor of God's word as we read. Mark chapter 12, verse 38. Jesus also taught, beware of these teachers of religious law, for they like to parade around in flowing robes and receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces, and how they love the seats of honor in the synagogues and the head at table banquets. Yet they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property and then pretend to be pious by making long prayers in public. Because of this, they will be more severely punished. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who were making contributions, for they gave a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. This is the word of the Lord. Please have a seat. In past days, we would be preparing for our offertory where we would pass the plate. We no longer do that. On the way out, you can put your donations into the boxes. You can do this online. And as we listen to the offertory music, that'll be our time to worship and give to the Lord in that way. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we get to come here in peace, unmolested, safe, comfortable. But Lord, I pray that for those who do not have this privilege, I pray, Lord, for those that are meeting in secret, meeting in fear of capture, discovery. I pray a blessing on them as they serve you, as they worship you. I bless them, Lord. I pray that we would receive the nourishment that Jonathan will bring us and that we would feast on it and we would act on it and that we would be a church of doers. I thank you for the blessings that you've given to us, and I pray that we would be a blessing to you and to others. I pray this in Jesus' name, and all God's people said.
Well, good morning, everybody. It is great to be back with you again. Uh, thank you for your warm welcome again. Thanks, Dave. Very creative. Liked it. Uh, and, you know, you've been so kind uh, to us over the last, to me, over the last three weeks that my, my family joined me this week to say hello. And, yeah. <laughs> Either that or they're checking where dad's been for the last three weeks. Has he been skipping out in church to go to the coffee shop? I'm here. So it's great. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to open up God's Word with you again. So thank you for having me. Uh, and let's do that. Over the last three weeks, my, my goal has been to expose you to three lesser known heroes of the faith. Three individuals who are somewhat insignificant, really, in, 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 in the history books of mankind. They're no big shots but they're strategically selected by God to be included in his copy of what he wants us to know about history. Why? Because God wants us uh, to make sure we don't waste our lives drifting along with empty pursuits. These individuals help us know what God wants. They model for us in, in, in flesh and blood what it is God wants from us, from those of us who follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. Recently, I read a quote that I found very impacting. It was by a very well-known, very influential uh, British political theorist and prolific author of yesteryear. Now, this chap had accomplished everything that the world deems to be successful. Wealth, reputation, fame, et cetera, et cetera. His influence was, was remarkable, but, but he writes a five-volume autobiography on his life. And at the very end in volume five, he says this, he passes this verdict on all that he's accomplished. He says, looking back at the age of 88, over the 57 years of my political work in England, knowing what I am at, and the results, meditating on the history of Britain and the world since 1914, I see clearly that I achieved practically nothing. I must have in a long life ground through between 150,000 and 200,000 hours of perfectly useless work. That's a frightening conclusion, verdict on one's life. Fifty-seven years, his entire adult life and expenditure, and he essentially says, I've achieved practically nothing. And he's now 88. There's no redos. But that is the only verdict that you can reach in any life when it's lived with minimal thought for God in your day in and your day out, with minimal thought and expenditure of your days on the Lord Jesus Christ, on, on His coming kingdom, and He is coming to rule. And all flesh, as we sang a few moments ago, will see His glory. More than frightening, it's actually tragic because a lot of believers can also live their lives achieving practically nothing of eternal worth. You're saved, you're secure, you're on the right side of the cross, but you can spend your days achieving practically nothing also. And that's not just frightening, that's tragic. So God helps us out and He gives us role models. And today I want to talk to you about what God wants, what He wants from all of us, what He wants from every single life through the example of His choice role model for us. And, and I know that you know that God wants more than a few Sundays a month and a few dollars in the offering plate and uh, to stand up and, 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 and sing when the guy in the front tells you to stand and sing. I know, you know that God wants more than that. But what specifically does he want? Because he does make very specific demands of his followers. Well, an unnamed poor little widow 
is going to show us how. So turn back to Mark chapter 12, please, if you have a copy of the Scriptures this morning. We're going to get to verse 38, which was read a few moments ago in a second. First, I want to situate you once again in the context that's there, in Mark chapter 11 and Mark chapter 12. In Mark 11, if you just glance back at it, you'll see that, that that's the, 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 the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ to Jerusalem. We're in his final week, his final days, and he heads to Jerusalem. And in chapter 11, we read what is observed traditionally as Palm Sunday. We celebrate it usually as Palm Sunday, his arrival at Jerusalem. And, and, and Jesus offers himself as king there. And on Sunday, Jerusalem is ecstatic with excitement. But by Friday, they're enraged. They crucify him. What happened? What happened to this religious crowd? Why, why the, the shift on Jesus? Well, essentially, they missed it. They, they missed him. They, they, they didn't get, they missed his call upon their lives. They missed God when God personally showed up in their city, and walked their streets, and preached in their temple. It's easy to do. It's easy to miss Jesus, even though he prods and he probes and he nudges. Sometimes he pushes. He calls and he beckons. It's easy to miss. I love the story, the Palm Sunday story, of a little boy called George. George had a sore throat and he couldn't go to church that Sunday. And that made him sad because he didn't like missing church. Uh, and when the rest of his siblings came home, they were all waving palm tree branches. He's like, well, that's fun. What's happened? And what what were you doing? And and one of his brothers said, oh, you know, uh, well, people held these palm branches over Jesus' head when he walked by on Palm Sunday. George is, what? Yeah, yeah. uh, uh, People held these palm branches over Jesus' head while he passed by on Palm Sunday. George was just stunned and, and, and saddened. And he said, ah, oh, man, wouldn't you know it? The one Sunday I miss church and Jesus shows up. <laughs> I love that. Little George was sad because he missed church and so he missed Jesus. And that's funny when it's a little joke, but it's tragic when many show up to church. They don't miss church, but they do miss Jesus' call on their life week after week after week the words of Scripture are opened up to them. And that's what's happening in chapter 11 with with that crowd. They're religious people, but they miss Jesus. They miss God. They don't see why, because He steps on their toes. He nudges, He pushes, He calls. He calls them out on what they don't want called out on. And so when we move into chapter 12, of Mark. We are in a series of conversations that are quite uh, confrontational that Jesus engages in with with some of the people back then. And it all occurs, in my opinion, on Wednesday. Some scholars say it's Tuesday, some say it's Wednesday. I, I go with Wednesday because I call this provocative Wednesday. And Tuesday's already got Taco Tuesday, right? So we need a provocative Wednesday to match Taco Tuesday. So uh, Jesus really pushes buttons here on Provocative Wednesday. And here's what I don't want you to miss. This happens at their church. This happens in their temple, their church, among the churched crowd like, like, like us, which makes it very, very appropriate and very, very relevant to you and perhaps a little dangerous to the preacher because Jesus steps on toes. But toes need stepping on on Provocative Wednesday. Chapter 12, this series of conversations really revolves around answering the question, what does God want? Fantastic question. What does God want from us? It can be framed in different ways. What, What does loyalty to God look like? How does God see loyalty to Him in my life? What does loyalty look like to God in your life? What does God want from us? 
And if you glance at chapter 12, you'll see at the very beginning that it begins with a, with a parable, the parable of the tenants. What does God want? Well, that parable tells us that he wants the religious leaders of the nation to stop rejecting his authority, to stop rejecting me. In fact, to stop rejecting the authority of God's Son, whom we know as the Lord Jesus Christ. Wouldn't it be wonderful to live in a nation where the leadership does not reject God's Son? Then it moves into a, a conversation that he has with a few there, and it's really a trap. And he deals with the issue of taxation and politics. It's very relevant. What, what does God want? Well, Jesus tells them that, that go ahead and give to Caesar... What is Caesar's, right? I mean, Caesar's face is on that coin. It's, it's proof of ownership. Just give to Caesar what is Caesar's. But here's the thing. God's image is minted on your life. And so you have to give to God yourself. You are the tax that God is owed. Give him your life. Then the next interaction with a, with, with a group, called the Sadducees. And the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection, so they go after Jesus concerning his view on the resurrection. And, and, and what does God want? Well, well, Jesus says to them, God wants you to submit to the Scriptures. God wants you to read your Bible and to believe the Bible because the Bible teaches the resurrection. Even when you don't like what the Word of God says about what you want to believe is what Jesus is saying to them. You don't get the build your own truth. You receive God's truth, and you sit under God's truth, and if He says it, and you don't know how it's going to work out, you trust Him. He's provocative Wednesday. I mean, He's picking fights with, with anyone who's coming to pick fights with Him. And then comes the central section in, in, in this series of interactions where, where Jesus essentially deals with a scribe who's also come to test Him, and it all revolves around the greatest commandment. What does God want? Well, it's the greatest commandment. It's so significant that I know Stonebriar has that as their motto as well, that you love God and that you love people. That's all coming out of Mark 12 or Matthew 22, which is all rooted in Deuteronomy 6. It's the summary of the entire Old Testament law. What does God want? That you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. You get the emphasis there. All, 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 all. There's two words in Greek for the word all. The one that's used here is, is derived from the word holos, and that's important. Holos, 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 all of you. God wants all of you, always. God wants all your life. To give God all your life is to love God and to love people. But what does loving God and loving people look like? What does all, 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 all actually look like? And the scribe that he's interacting with knows that it's way more than good, godly, churchy activities like showing up at synagogue or church and tithing a few dollars and singing when the guy at the front says, get up and sing. The, the scribe recognizes that. He knows that there's more to that. There's nothing wrong with those things if they're rightly motivated. God wants all, 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 all. Well, that's followed with a little uh, statement that Jesus makes, and, and, and he takes the initiative here, and it's very, very inflammatory because what he says is this, that King David had a son whom King David refers to as Lord. And Jesus is presenting himself as King David's son, whom King David recognizes is his Lord. It's very, very inflammatory. But then we arrive at the shores of our passage for this morning on Provocative Wednesday, where, where Jesus now moves to a little bit of a, it's not a show and tell like the kids do at school. It's, it's a tell and show. That's what Jesus has done. I've told you, I've told you, I've told you, now I'm going to show you what God wants. And he presents us with two examples, two illustrations, very, very concrete examples of what God wants, of what God doesn't want, two examples of what all, 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 all looks like, and two examples of what all, 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 all does not look like. 
very clear. So let me spend our time that's left just helping you understand that. Verse uh, 38 picks up an example number one. It runs right the way through to verse 40, just a few verses, where Jesus tells us what he doesn't want. In fact, what God detests from churchy people. Verse 38, and in his teaching, remember, this is at the temple, this is at church, Jesus said, beware of the scribes. It's a warning. Beware, beware of the scribes. It's a warning to heed. And Jesus directs his attention. He singles out a particular group, the scribes. And the scribes are basically lawyers. <laughs> yeah, let that sit for a while. <laughs> the, the lawyers among you are sort of sinking in your seat. Uh, don't panic. Lawyers back then were a little different than lawyers today. The lawyers back then were experts in the law, yes, but the law back then was the law of God. They were experts in the Bible, so they're more akin to the pastors and the preachers and the teachers of the Word. They're, they're more akin to me. I, I should be the one that's sort of sinking here. In Matthew's version, he, he uses the term somewhat interchangeably with Pharisees, right? The, the pastors, those who, those who taught people God's Word. Jesus isn't just turning tables in the temple. He's turning people's minds, their understanding of what they've always conceived to be what God wants, what godliness looks like, what loyalty to God is. And what he's saying is, it's not that. Those are powerful words. It's not them. What God wants doesn't look like that. Watch out for them. Stay away from them. Don't make them the template of your life. Provocative Wednesday. Why? Look at verse 38. Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes. They're all about looking good in church in their version of Sunday best. And two, because they like greetings in the marketplace. They want to be acknowledged publicly. Verse 39. And because they want to have the best seats in the synagogues, the best seats in church. And the best places of honor at feasts, they want red carpet, VIP treatment at public events. That's what they want. But look at verse 40. But they devour widows' houses. And for a pretense, they make long prayers. What Jesus is saying here is, uh, look at what they wear and look at the, how they walk around, and look at what they want, uh, and look at their long-winded words in prayer. Uh, and you might think that, that they're a godly bunch that I should emulate and I should copy, but they're not. They're not. They wear those churchy clothes to appear godly. There's nothing wrong with dressing up for church, but there is something detestable to God if you're doing it just so that you appear godly in their long robes. They wear these churchy clothes to appear godly. They walk around in public places because they can't sit at home on their own. And it's not because they're, you know, extroverts. It's because nobody gives them any attention at home. Okay, the dog might wag the tail and smile at them from time to time, but I don't get praise at home. I need to be out where the people are at, where people know my name, and where people can essentially Acclaim me. Applause me. That's what he's going after here. They want positions and places in society that, that grant them attention. Treat me like a VIP. And their words in prayer are filled with Christianese talk that, that make it look like these people have access to God. They really have God's ear. But it's all fake because they devour the widow's houses. In that society, widows often went to scribes to try and arrange their estate upon the death of their husband. And these individuals clearly are abusing that position. Sure, and I'll pray for you, but they're exploiting these widows. Jesus is essentially saying, don't live to appear to be godly like those smooth-talking frauds. It's all a sham. It sure looks good, but do you get that this really bothers Jesus? It really does bother Jesus. 
If you don't, if you haven't picked that up yet from me in the last few moments, read Matthew 23. That's Matthew's version of this event. He devotes a whole chapter to it, and he does not hold back. Jesus does not hold back. Now, now don't read it. Don't tuck your kids in at night with that Bible story. That's going to give them nightmares. Jesus calls them a brood of vipers and a bunch of hypocrites. But Jesus' strongest words are for churchy-looking people who sing and who pray and who look good in church all dressed up, but they don't give God what He truly wants. There's nothing wrong, of course, with churchy activities at all, but they are if they're wrongly motivated, if they're fake, if they're, they're, if they're hypocritical. Hypocrisy, pretending to be what one is not, is extremely disappointing. Now, I've gone hard and heavy, but I still want you to understand what hypocrisy is. So let me give you what I believe to be the best word picture I can think of or conceive of of hypocrisy. Are you ready for it? It's this. It's peacocks. Yeah, the bird. Think about it. Peacocks are a good-looking but useless bird. They really are. I mean, they're a fake bird. I mean, think about it. They, they don't, you don't see peacocks running around our streets. No, no, no. They only strut around fancy hotels. If you've been to a fancy hotel, you know what I'm talking about. They, they just seem to be everywhere. They can walk around. Or zoos. But they're not caged in like all the other animals in a zoo. They, they can strut around freely. In fact, peacocks have are robed in beautiful plumage, and, and, and if you go to a zoo, if you go to a nice hotel and you see them, you, know, you will go, ooh, that's nice. Oh, that really looks, that's a good-looking bird. In fact, next time you notice one, here's what you will notice as well. They'll stop in front of you, and they'll look at you, and they'll say something like, hurry up, big guy, take my photo. I've got things to do. <laughs> like, it's all about them. They're, they're a hypocritical bird, and here's why. Can they fly? No. Not really. I mean, they can get a few feet off the ground, but a peacock isn't known for its flying. A peacock can't really fly. What bird can't fly? Do they produce eggs for our breakfast tacos? No. Do they contribute to Chick-fil-A's nuggets for us all? No. They, 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 they don't. They don't even nibble on the scraps that we drop at the zoo. They're above that, right? Peacocks are showmen. Peacocks are posers. Peacocks advertise themselves as good-looking birds, but I don't think they qualify as a bird. They're pretenders. They're hypocritical birds and Hypocrisy is disappointing, but hypocrisy is also disgusting, detestable. I love the story of the, the pastor who, who was visiting one of the elderly ladies in his church, and he went in to see her, and he was a little hungry, and he was sitting talking to her. He noticed on the coffee table there was a bowl of peanuts, and he said to her, you know, I, I'm a little hungry. Do you mind if I nibble on some of these peanuts? And she said, knock yourself out. Enjoy. And he did, and they talked for an hour. And when he was about to leave, he realized he's, he'd pretty much eaten the whole bowl of peanuts. And so he said to her, listen, I'm really, really sorry. I, I, I've eaten the whole bowl of peanuts on you. And she said, oh, pastor, it's all right. Don't worry about it. Ever since I lost my teeth, all I can do is suck the chocolate coating off <laughs> the chocolate peanuts. <laughs> and so I just put them back in there. <laughs> yuck. Double Yuck right? Sucked peanuts that promote themselves as appetizing to hungry pastor. <laughs> Peacocks that parade themselves as birds. Churchy looking people who are far from what God wants on the inside. They really look good on the outside, detestable to Jesus. It's not me speaking here. That's Jesus speaking here. Those scribes, they knew the Word of God. They knew the greatest commandment. That God wants you to love Him and that God wants you to love Him through your love for other people. But did they have genuine love for God? No. 
They're competing with God for the people's attention and admiration. They want to be treated like gods, not love God. They have no love for people. They're profiting off the backs of the most vulnerable in society back then, the widows. But they sure look good strutting around their church, the temple, like religious peacocks. Look at verse 40, what Jesus says concerning them. They will receive the greater condemnation. They will receive the greater condemnation. You can con those around you. You can con yourself, but you cannot con God. You can't con God. He sees, and he points out. So illustration number one, example number one, at the climactic section of what God wants is that he detests religious-looking living. He detests Christian peacocks. That's set up as a contrast to our our hero, our lesser known hero. Illustration number two pops up in verse 41, all the way through to verse 44, and she becomes the, the embodiment, according to Jesus, of what God wants. His show and tell become a tell and show. Here it is. This is what I want. And it's not a life that detests God, but, but the life that God desires, right? So that, so that you and I, like she, live out our days achieving practically something eternally worthwhile. Verse 41, and he, that is Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury, and he watched how the people put money into the offering box. He watches how the people put money into the offering box. And so Jesus sits, the people watch. And and people watching is a fun activity. Try it. Even in church. Like, come on up here and and watch. (laughs) It it is quite interesting. People watching is fun. And Jesus is people watching here in church. And people watching is extremely revealing. Last uh, spring break, my family and I, uh, we went uh, to a place, uh, one of the top picks on planet Earth that I will never want to go to ever again, Six Flags. <laughs> I'm telling you, and we went on St. Patrick's Day. It was St. Patrick's Day, and so uh, in my opinion, Six Flags should feature in Dante's Inferno. Uh, it, it, was, it was tough, but anyway, a redeeming feature of being there w- when you're queuing up for ours is that you get to people watch. And people are wonderful, and people are weird. And people are wonderfully weird. And you know what? One of the things that stood out, among many things, is that when people can't project their dumb ideas on you on social media, because they're climbing on their roller coaster, they will project it on their t-shirts. So you've got all these t-shirts that people are wearing, that are trying to say something about themselves, and some of them are very funny, and some of them are very, very rude. And it's shocking that that someone would so boldly and so flagrantly display that in their shirt. But the most common shirt that day got under my skin, because you know what it was? Luck of the Irish. St. Patrick's Day. I wanted to go to each one of them and say, really? I'm actually Irish. And I do not feel very lucky today. I'm at Six Flags. (laughs) It's crazy. But anyway, you learn a lot about people, just people watching. And Jesus sees, and Jesus people watches. And get this, Jesus is people watching at church. That's going to make you sit up. And he's people watching during offering time. That's going to make some people sweat. Jesus is watching them, and, and, and he notices uh, what is very revealing, and it's related to giving, right? Giving is very revealing. It's revealing of your heart's loyalties. It's, it's revealing of what your heart wants. You see, your wallet follows your heart every time. Your wallet follows your heart. And so the background here is that in that temple treasury, there were 13 receptacles, 13 
offering boxes, as it were, and they, they were shaped like a funnel. They were shaped like a trumpet. But you throw in your coins, and that would all funnel down into a box. And we believe that those 13 offering boxes were primarily for free will gifts, because the mandated gift, the temple tax, had to be recorded, had to be noted. And so you wanted them to note that you'd paid it. But, but these offerings seemed to be free will offerings. And some of them were designated, and some of them were undesignated. And so Jesus is watching this. And he's, he, he, he's watching all these people show up and give. And it's quite a spectacle because back then they don't have paper currency. It's all coins. And so you can make quite a racket throwing your coins into the offering plate. And so he's watching this and he's observing. And look at what he sees. Verse 41, the tail end of it there, he says, Many rich people put in large amounts. But, so he's intentionally coming off with a contrast. But a poor widow came, and she put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. So he sees two things. Lots of rich people, they're putting in lots of money, and that's a good thing if it's rightly motivated. And if you're rich, you should put in lots of money to God's kingdom work. That's, that's a good thing. And we learned that from Zacchaeus a few weeks back, that the genuine gratitude to God manifests itself in generosity toward your community, toward what God is doing in the world. You partner with Jesus on his mission to seek and save the lost. And so there's nothing wrong with rich people giving lots. It's expected. But he notices the second thing. A poor widow comes and gives too. And so the contrast shifts more so toward, here's people of significant status, and here's someone of no status in society. She's going to blend into the crowds. Nobody's going to notice her. She's not going to get VIP treatment. She's the type of lady that the guys who do get VIP treatment exploit. And so she shows up, and, and, and nobody notices her, but Jesus sees her. And he sees her put her little hand in her little purse and draw out two little tiny coins, the smallest coins you could possibly have at the time. And she places them as a free will gift in one of those boxes. We know how much those two small copper coins are worth. They're worth a tiny, tiny little bit above nothing. Nothing. 128th of a denarius, which is a day's wage, which essentially translates into way less than a dollar in today's currency. She gives way less than a dollar. In fact, the English, the old English, uses the word mite, right? The widow's mite. Mite's not an insect. Mite actually is an English word that comes through the French, and it means crumbs, breadcrumbs. She gives into the offering plate a little bit about above nothing. She gives crumbs. But look what Jesus does. He called his disciples, verse 43. He called his disciples to him. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who were contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she out of her poverty has put in all she had all she had to live on. I don't know if Jesus grabbed the little lady, hugged her, kissed her, brought her over to the disciples and soon-to-be apostles of the church and said, you want to learn how to represent me? Here's your real model. I don't, I don't know, but I do know that he singles her out, this insignificant little lady, in, in, the, in the eyes of the world, and he says, that's what God wants. Her, her story is placed as the climax of the entire section. That's what God wants, according to Jesus. Why? Why is giving a little bit above nothing so significant to Jesus? That's not going to pay off the church debt. That's not going to pay the temple AC bill and the pastor's salaries and all those scribes. How is crumbs what God wants? Well, because for Jesus, this is not about the quantity of your monetary giving. 
This is not about the quantity of your monetary giving. God does not need your loan. The earth is the Lord's, the psalmist tells us, and everything in it, even what's in your bank account and in your wallet. For Jesus, this is not about the quantity of monetary giving. For Jesus, this is all about the quality of her living. The quality of her living. You see, that reveals your heart for God, your heart for people. Jesus is watching, remember, how not what people give. They, they give what they will never miss, but she gives what she is definitely going to miss tomorrow. They give out of their surplus, we're told. It might be 2%, it might be 10%, it might be 20%, it might even be 50%, but they're giving out of their surplus. They can leave church that day, head home, stop somewhere and get lunch out, go home, grab a bath if they want, once the Cowboys come back on TV, they can put their feet up and watch the Cowboys lose again. <laughs> this isn't affecting their life, but you see, she gives not from surplus. She gives in sacrifice. She gives in sacrifice. That little bit above nothing. Those crumbs that she gives to God are actually 100% of her. If you look at the last phrase, the last phrase in chapter 12, which is in her story, is extremely significant. Uh, many translations have it as she give she ha she, all that she had to live on. They, they keep in the, in the monetary realm, but the actual literal translation shifts in that phrase to all her life. Way grander than money, monetary giving. She's not putting money into that offering plate. She's pouring her life into that offering plate. She gave all her life. The totality of it. Jesus is watching actions here, but of course Jesus is weighing hearts. And she's the real deal. She's not a fake follower. In fact, the shift, there's a couple of things I want you to see, and I know I've been going on a while, and this gets a little heavy, but I need you to track with me. There's a shift in word that occurs here. Remember, uh, she, four times, when I read it, I tried to emphasize it, four times the word all is repeated. All, 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 all. Some translations don't like it. It seems too very repetitive, so they'll go all, all, everything, all. But the word's the same. It's, it's all. It's all, 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 all. She gave all, 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 all. That's significant. Why a fourfold repetition in a few verses by Jesus of all, 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 all. And then, again, you won't pick up this up in the English. In the four alls that are found in her little section, the first three use the word pass for all, which is a, is a, is a legitimate word for all. All pass, all pass, all pass. But the fourth one shifts. Why does it shift? In the phrase that captures the entire section, all her life. It shifts to signal a literary connection with what Jesus has already said. The shift is to the word holos. Pass, 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 holos. She gave all, 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 but when he shifts to holos all, we're reminded of what Jesus said a few verses back in the greatest commandment that you're to give God all holos, your heart. All holos, your soul. All holos, your mind. All holos, your strength. She is being connected with the very verse that indicates what it is that God wants. What it means to love God and to love people. To give all your life to God. This poor anonymous little widow lived that out and she becomes Jesus' example of what it means to fulfill the greatest commandment of loving God and loving people. Now, there's a better example to come, but she's the best example so far. The better example to come is who? The Lord Jesus Christ himself, who gives his all in love to God and in love to people. Jesus is essentially saying she gets it. 
She gets it. She loved God with her all. She loved the people of her community with her all. In fact, remember, this is a free will gift. She doesn't have to give that day. And she has two small coins. Mark wants you to note that she has two small coins because she could easily have given one, kept the other, and still given 50% of her belongings or income. This is a remarkable woman. What I'm, what I'm trying to say, and I hope you're picking up on it, is this is no religious peacock. I'm going to stick to the bird analogy and shock you a little bit more. Up until recently, I didn't have a favorite bird, but I do now, and it's a pigeon. <laughs> I know, it's funny. Pigeons are ugly. They're insignificant, humble little birds. They don't, they don't get paraded around zoos. They don't get paraded around hotels. I mean, in fact, they're deemed... Aerial rodents, right? Let's get rid of the pigeons. But pigeons are remarkable birds. I mean, they are the, the real deal. They're an epitome of what a bird is. Did you know that long before uh, we had the internet, pigeons were our ancient emailing system? I'm serious. For centuries, people have been tying little messages to pigeons' legs and sending them off to transmit a message somewhere else. They're remarkable little birds. They can fly over a thousand miles without stopping. Remember? Peacock, two feet off the ground. Pigeon, a thousand miles with a message strapped to its little heel. Remarkable bird. Did you know that they have an internal navigation system that responds to the Earth's magnetic forces so that the pigeon knows how to get to places with precision. Long before we had maps, satellites, global positioning systems, little pigeons were getting about knowing exactly where they were. They clean our streets by eating our scraps. We race them. You know there's pigeon racing? There's pigeon racing because they're so athletic. Peacocks don't race. <laughs> Peacocks don't race at all. Pigeons are so brave that they play chicken with me on the road. <laughs> I'm driving. I'm like, please move. Please move. And he's not moving. And, and I'm, I'm thinking of swerving myself, but I know that's not right. It's dangerous. Uh, and I think I hit it, and then you see that it's just hopping along, you know, fine. Somehow it was athletic enough to just hop out of the way. Squirrels don't do that. <laughs> Texas roads, there's squirrels everywhere. Pigeons are remarkable, and they live, did you know that pigeons live in community, and they don't fight? And they live in horrible places like under bridges, but they don't fight. They're a communal bird, and they don't fight exceptional, yet ugly, granted, little birds. The real deal, the template of what a bird should be. This unnamed widow is to God what a pigeon is to a bird. The, the example, the epitome, the template of what he wants in a human life. That gives to God what God wants. And, and she's unaware that Almighty God's eyes are on her that day in that busy church courtyard. And yet they are. And that he is historically going to use her as an example of what he desires. She is the embodiment of giving God your all, 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 all. Holos, 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 holos. Total allegiance, total loyalty to God. Pouring yourself onto the offering plate, not just a few dollars, not just a few Sundays, not just a few songs when the guy up front says, hey, would you stand up and sing? Remarkable. Let me make it very, very simple. What God wants essentially is this, Christian pigeons. That's what God wants. God wants Christian pigeons, not Christian pigeons, not, not Christian peacocks. 
Uh, so let me leave you with one question in closing today. Just one question by way of application. Take this home with you this week and answer it for yourself. And, and, and seriously consider it because I want you to end your life being able to pass a verdict on your life that says I did give my all to the Lord Jesus Christ. My life wasn't lived out for practically no useful function in, in society. And the question is, is simple. And I, I might even ask you to consider getting a close friend or your spouse to answer it with you. And it's no joke. It's serious. The question is this. Am I a Christian peacock or am I a Christian pigeon? It's chased me all week. Am I, Lord, a Christian peacock or am I, Lord, a Christian pigeon? Because I want to give you what you deserve. We want to give you what you deserve. All, 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 all. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word. It's so relevant. Of course it is. You strategically selected what you put in there to guide our lives. Thank you for allowing us to sit under it. Help us in the power of the Holy Spirit this week to answer that question honestly and to deal with it so that we live lives before you in our generation that was meaningful eternally. Father, I thank you personally for these weeks that I've had with my brothers and sisters here at Stonebriar. I pray your blessing upon this congregation this year. I pray that you'd be honored by our lives as they unfold this week. In Jesus' name, amen.